Well, let's get talking now. Our first conversation for the show stays with the power sector. Now, since the privatization of Nigeria's power sector in November 2013, with six power generation plants and 11 distribution companies handed over to the private sector, the state of electricity supply in the country is still erratic, constrained by myriads of challenges ranging from gas shortage, poor maintenance, dilapidated infrastructure, amongst others. Despite various financial interventions into the power sector to curb grid collapses as well as develop its capacity, the nation's average power generation has continued to drop, leading to incessant grid collapse as power generation on the national grid recently dropped by 502.7 megawatts on Tuesday from the peak of 4,688.6 megawatts to 4,185.9 megawatts. Meanwhile, the federal government's deal with the German engineering firm Siemens to rehabilitate and expand the country's energy transition network has been described as a, a promising development that could promote a thriving power sector in the country. To give more insights into this development and, of course, the present issues, current issues, the devil in Nigeria's power sector, I'm being joined by Zoom by the former chairman of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC, uh, is Dr. Sam Amadi. Dr. Amadi, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's right for me to start on this note. At the moment, uh, the National Union of Electricity Employees have actually or gradually shut down power all across because of what they are facing or the face of with the transmission company of Nigeria. Uh, what do you understand about some of these issues? Many times it's always around workers' welfare and all of that, not really about improving what we have on ground. Well, I, I don't have the details of this new confrontation, but uh, clearly, uh, whatever any, any UEE, you know, it's two workers, right? Uh, go on such face off. It's all about their welfare. Again, we can uh, maintain some level of uh, morality and say that they never strike or they never uh, um, confront the government on the quality of power supply, which some of their personnel are uh, involved either in, in, in corruption or in acts of indiscipline or basically inefficiency. But the point is look, their responsibility as a trade union. It is to put their work as a trust. And we know that uh, trade unions all over the world, oftentimes uh, the unintended consequence of the activism is that they don't serve public interests. The question is how to defend public interest. In this sector, part of the public interest would be that uh, management treats workers well. Now, the problem is PCN remains uh, a government owned entity, wholly owned by government. And so, uh, whereas in the distribution companies, uh, in the generation companies, we see contradiction when uh, uh, any UEA or NLC wants to compulsorily unionize them. You can argue that being private entities, maybe uh, those uh, employers would, you know, get off from this union. But here is a government entity. But the question is, why are we having this crisis all the time? Why is it difficult, not just in the sector, look at the medical sector, education, other labor sectors? We are seeing increasing face off, increasing lack of uh, ability for management and staff to have a smooth process, negotiations, discussions, and uh, execute agreements. So, yeah, it adds to, to, to the risk of the sector. This is a sector that is basically ready to comatose or rather uh, in fit, fitful state of health where. It goes up, it goes down, it, it, it collapses, it builds up gradually. It doesn't need this level of uncertainty. It doesn't need this level of shutdown or threatened shutdown. Uh, and um, interestingly, uh, government often don't act proactively. Then when any, any UE or NLC goes on this kind of strike or confrontation, and the system collapses, or we see very serious uh, undersupply of power, then they could get back after the act to now start negotiating and doing the same thing they want to do. So two things here is maybe uh, they, we wanted to we privatize actually to get into an efficient market system. We are seeing that maybe we are even more less efficient than we are even under public ownership. We are seeing greater degree of management labor crisis. Worse than 
maybe arguably than we had when it was still on the government code. So it calls for a serious review as to do we, you know, some people argue, you know, privatize everything in spite of the fact that the ones privatized are not really sure good result, or do we, you know, bring a much more um, strategic leadership in the sector in a way that even if there are conflicts and there will be those conflicts, labor management and workers, it will not get to the point in which the, the continuous supply of electricity is threatened. That's really, uh, in a sense, electricity is an essential service. That does not mean that they shouldn't unionize, but it means that, that the, the, the resort to downing tools should be extreme measure that shouldn't be made except you know, in very, very rare situations. By government, uh, we, we all know that. And um, that argument has been there from all sides that some even say it is the weakest link. But TCN will tell you that no, they are not. Uh, that, that, that's not the weakest link in the power sector value chain. Do you think that if the TCN were to be fully privatized and investors run in that space, do you think it could be better than what we have? I think it would be worse if we privatize, we will privatize the discos. And, uh... The, the rating companies for two reasons. One, the level of coordination and efficiency required for TCN as a, a gateway, as as a, a hub, and as the you know the the carrier, the transport link for power is such that if we get it wrong, as we are getting it wrong in discos, I mean if a disco is inefficient, maybe a few a few customers will suffer, maybe others will have power. A localized crisis. If a disco is have a crisis, let's say Abuja disco, Lagos, Eko, and other part of the country could be in relative good supply. But if the transmission company, as it is today, a national transmission company won't centralize dispatch, if it suffers huge this uh, lack of coordination because of failed privatization, everything is down. So I think it's a sector. If you're going to privatize it. You have to privatize it with better design, clarity, and coordination than we have now. Think about the technology backbone, SCADA. One of the details you learn from the economics of power sector is that when you unbundle, even though unbundling potentially leads to efficiency and prepares for competition, but the reverse could be that if you unbundle, you enhance coordination problem, because in, in the past, you used to have disco, jenko, uh, transmission in one, one ownership, that can integrate it. It makes for, it's cost efficient. But when you're bundle, you are getting efficiency potentially at the cost of high degree of managerial coordination. So you need a SCADA technology. For lack of SCADA, the fact that our technology backbone for transmission is very weak. It's part of why it's a, a very a frail network and we have you know, regular Systemic collapse. So, if we're going to privatize the way we did, like classically, the way we did it, you know, whoever comes throughout the benchmark, because the market is not, has no appetite for our assets, do that for for transmission. That will be the end of this sector. So, I would argue that we should be talking about privatizing transmission network. Now. We're probably looking at regionalizing it and increasing maybe private public partnership. A much more a robust and efficient, coherent management contract to come in, open it up for investments, commercialize it fully. But for now, walk through a process so that when you increase efficiency, then you can privatize. The problem with the way we are privatized is that privatization is not the answer to inefficiency necessarily. It's, it's actually competition that gives efficiency more than profit. But again, there are certain natural monopolies, as we so call them, which you need better regulation or, at best, public ownership efficiency. At this point, unlike in the US and elsewhere, we had a grid was viewed as a private monopoly. So you see, private monopolies, meaning companies that are already entrenched providing those transmission services, they are privately owned, but they are monopolies. So everybody feed on them, they have established protocols. They, they, they are properly regulated, and there is no discriminatory dispatch, and rarely do you have collapses. So example from California, the crisis in the energy sector, shows that excessive 
experimentation and privatization would actually destroy the power sector because the power sector is a very intricate complex and requires efficient coordination. If you privatize and or bundle in a manner that you don't have that efficient coordination, you earn more inefficiency and then that might need to collapse. So I would say that, look, probably we talk about regionalizing the grid, fully commercialize it, and then government appoint, look at the way they appoint management. The critical argument for public enterprise is if you manage it like commercial private entities with the best in kind management, best in kind technology, and hard budget line, like the economy said, you could approximate efficiency of the private sector with regulation. And that's why we have a regulator. regulator. Regulation is a way of simulating competition in a monopoly, whether it's private or public. So I think the answer is not just private. The answer is the basics. How, look at the people who are appointed to the board. In fact, as a matter of fact, I don't know up to now, but for a long time, they, they, we didn't have a, a, a board for the TCL that is supposed to be a, a, a merit-based board with regulatory control in terms of independent director, whistleblowers, who will create real boards that have competence, that people who have capacity, and then you manage it as best as you can, not as part of government department of measure of power. Those you know, disciplines that we learn, we refuse to learn, are the problem. And so if you privatize hastily the way we did the power sector, you will sink this uh, market totally because the inefficiency will be very acute and such that it can't even localize the problem, sterilize, and the system will collapse more people than we see. Engineering firms, that cement deal. I know we've talked about this before, uh, but what do you expect really from this kind of um, well, partnership or deal with Siemens uh, to help uh, you know, the country's transmission network and all of that. Uh, do you see light at the end of the tunnel? Well, the problem with Nigerian uh, projects and deals, no matter whether in the power sector or the oil and gas sector, is a lack of clarity as to you know, clear, honest uh, uh, deliverables that are monitored. First, if this deal as advertised, is to provide this needed um, structural support for the power sector, to the discipline and the, and the instruction level, uh, equipment, um, support that probably they can provide those things. They will help. And maybe they're helping minimally in small measures in terms of improving, uh, changing transformers, changing all kinds of uh, particular equipments that need to be. You need to really revamp the sector. People forget that part of the crisis of this sector, and that's why privatization was a wrong idea at this point, was that the city has collapsed. So if you're going to privatize without having very large inflow of finance to obvious to generally revamp the sector, remove the bad machineries, put new ones, you know, create a better level of technology and technical efficiency, then you will not get the value uh, for money. We're not going to get the level. So the Siemens deal was a way of dealing with the obvious lack of competent technical capacity and financial capacity of the school uh, transmission operators. Uh, it, so the question then is, how robust and how efficient is the deployment? So if, if you are making interventions that do not build a momentum to significantly overcome a structural inefficiency, it ends up being like, you know, a whisper in a crowd. So you, you are in a, people are in the stadium shouting and you are whispering. Nobody hears you. So yes, they may have, it might be too small to, to create that, catalyze that rapid and quick transformation. Or it might need a time lag for some of those investments in the deal would be foot. And also, they may need to be complemented by good public sector management. The level of policy by the ministry, level of regulation by the regulator. So if these complementary uh, components of these change management strategies fail, then the, 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 the deployment of technology from the Siemens deal perspective may not be enough to create that level of change that we want. So you, you, this is, Nigeria has a chronic problem of project management. And from that perspective, you need to diagnose the problem very well. Know that the interventions you are um, proposing 
we deal with what we call a strategy, the crux, the crux, the real problem that generates the, um, the symptoms that we see. So oftentimes, misdiagnosis, so the intentions are good, the deployment of uh, resources and interventions are well meaning, but are not directed at the, at the driver of the problem. Or sometimes they're too little to constitute a, a change. And thirdly, they are undermined by other significant inefficiencies, really in policy and in project management by tax owners, TCL officials, the discos, the regulator, and the ministry. So in a sense, even if on paper, it, this, uh, the CMS deal is the right kind of intervention to deal with this crisis of lack of financing, lack of change management, the disco transmission network. If it's not properly implemented, it still will come down to. So in essence, we don't have good results so far. Maybe it's the same old project management problem or the time, the, the, the time lag is still not enough for us to see transformation. But I would rather doubt that the cement deal will really break the bone, the back of the uh, seemingly interminable crisis of this sector. Finally, Doc, uh, Dr. Amadi, before I, I, I let you go, we've talked so very much about cost-reflective tariffs. And the discos will always say that they are yet to break even, uh, considering all the losses, uh, commercial and uh, AT and C losses. I know you understand all of these terms, Dr. Amadi. But uh, which comes first? Because Nigerians will tell you, is it the chicken or the egg? Do we need supply before we sh increase tariff? Or what do we do? We know some areas where if you're ready to pay, you get supply. I think we should do both. We should do all. For example, and by the way, tariffs have been improving, maybe not to the level that, uh, uh, that will be truly cost-reflective. Cost and then the cost-reflective tariff is also contextual. It depends on what time zone are you looking at. For example, if the uh, uh, RR, the, required, uh, the delivery requirement of the sector is 100 million, and it can be recovered in five years or 10 years now, there will be deferred recovery, meaning that in the first year or second year, probably you recover only 10%. Everybody knows that they're owing you. But as an operator, you know that the capacity, the supply condition cannot allow for recovery of up to 80% of the cost for that year. So what is required in the economics of the commerce of this of power is that you're going to borrow, borrow money to beat that gap. And as long as those deferred payments, are, you're allowed to recover them. And power improves, and then the tariffs go up than they were before, and the quantity supply is more, and the, the, the unit cost is lower, or not as low as high as it could have been, and then the total revenue increases. So from that perspective, there will be not much problem, because at the end of that 15 years or 10 years or five years, you have you are made whole again. But what's happening in this sector is because the project sector is cash trapped and has high debt over the operators don't have the capacity to bridge that gap and you know meet up with financing for, for capital and other O and M costs while waiting for the tariff to shift upward because conditions are now able to carry those tariffs. So that's the problem we have: the problem of revenue, access to financing. And the inability of the operators also to, to, to manage to borrow to finance their projects while improvement comes and then those tariffs are unlocked everywhere in the world. The regulators will not allow you to collect at a particular time tariffs that you desire because of very many social conditions. So, whereas I am in support of unlocking the tariff to, so that we are paying the real cost for what we consume, but that process. Realistically, and the discourse themselves know, so the CEOs acknowledge, you can't take a tariff to 150% at, at the one first week. I mean, it becomes a shock. And even you, the disco, cannot recover your money because when the tariff is, is too expensive, if the, if the power is too expensive, then incentive to self supply becomes high. And incentive to, to, to steal power, to, to, to refuse to pay, it becomes higher. And so, Discos and CEOs know that there's a realistic level of the tariff increase at a particular time. What then happens short haul in 
the market is strong, that has supply, that has credit worthiness, and that the operators have access to capital. They will borrow, the regulator will permit and approve for to bridge that gap. And the real deal is that you will increase so that power will supply. So for example, if you are doing 4,000 megawatts today average, and then we did a tariff of X plus two, we'll give X plus one. And then in the next year, when we want to unlock it, we are doing 8,000. Arguably, you discover that with increasing capacity, the unit cost of that recovery, this good as a reduced capital cost that will not be repeated as capacity grows. So what that means is that the unit cost that will allow you to recover that shortfall and the new investment may not be as high as plus two. It cannot be X plus one and a half. That's how it works. You have to improve quantity, improve quantity of source of supply, then the tariff unlocks as it proves. But what happens is that even if you unlock the tariff to the end, you have no guarantee that in the next one or two years that the, the supply quantity will increase, supply quality will increase, the extent that the customers have incentive to go to pay that very high tariff, and also they have enough supply to, you know, maybe reduce the unit cost of power. That is where we are right now. So yes, we have to focus on the tariff to make them cost reflective. But cost reflective is not a magic bullet that will solve all the problem. It has to be done strategically in a manner that allows the schools to continue to cover their money, but also make it more affordable to the people in order not to increase the incidence of power theft and of refusing to pay bills, which will basically bring us to ground zero, where the debt profile is very high, the recovery is still low in spite of high tax. I must thank you so much, Dr. Sam Amadi, uh, there for your views on this very important topic of discourse. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.